In this episode, we provide an overview of the World Health Organization's report on the global tobacco epidemic 2021. We speak with Dr. Colin Mendelson about the looming restrictions to come into effect in Australia on the 1st of October and provide updates on what is happening in Malaysia, Mexico, and New Zealand. Lastly, we announce the launch of a new global advocacy initiative. On July 27th, the World Health Organization released its report on the global tobacco epidemic 2021. Let's review. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone on the line. The introduction to the live launch of the report sets the tone of what is to follow. So so on behalf of the World Health Organization, supported by Bloomberg Philanthropies, I'm really proud to welcome you all to the global launch of the WHO report on the global tobacco epidemic 2021. The opening statement made by WHO Director General Dr. Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus fully exposed the extent that he is willing to go to please his main private donor. Newer products like e-cigarettes pose a new danger marketed with flavors to appeal to children and adolescents. These products should be regulated to protect public health. WHO is committed to working with you for a tobacco-free world. And then, as if that wasn't enough, their ambassador for tobacco control takes to the podium to pontificate his agenda. Hello, everyone and congratulations to the WHO on the new Empower report. Bloomberg Philanthropies has worked closely with the WHO to fight tobacco since 2008, and we've seen extraordinary progress. But at the same time, new products like flavored e-cigarettes pose major threats, especially to young people. Tobacco companies are promoting them as safe alternatives to cigarettes and other tobacco products. It's another dangerous chapter in the industry's history of deception. If we don't act, another generation of kids could get addicted to nicotine, and we can't let that happen. Some countries are already taking action, and by highlighting their efforts, this report will help others join them. Dr. Adriana Blanco Marquiso, the head of the Secretariat for the WHO FCTC, then proceeded with her thoughts which were a regurgitation of the Bloomberg narrative based on their version of science. As this most recent report shows, new challenges lie ahead. Electronic nicotine delivery systems, also known as e-cigarettes, and novel tobacco products are promoted as healthier alternatives to smoking by their manufacturers and for many of these products is the same tobacco industry that is producing them, and by their supporters. But anti-independent research shows the real risk profile of these products, governments should be cautious. Science-based evidence, not marketing, should guide their action. The remainder of the time was taken up with an explanation of the research, a bunch of flashy graphics and promotional videos, Then they pulled out the heavy artillery, the children. We encourage young people to work with uh, CSO or WHO to uh, uh, send the message to the government to strengthen the uh, tobacco uh, control policy, such as the ban of e-cigarette. They're very sleek, they're modern, and they're they're very new age products, which um, in no way look like they're dangerous at all. It's very, very important for us to get um, the right education. Like in 2018, 63% of Juul users didn't know that there was actually nicotine in them. Flabbergasted by the sheer stupidity, the tobacco harm reduction experts weighed in on the contents of the report. John Britton, the Emeritus Professor of Epidemiology at the University of Nottingham said, This report demonstrates that, sadly, the WHO still does not understand the fundamental difference between addiction to tobacco smoking, which kills millions of people every year, and addiction to nicotine, which doesn't. The WHO is also evidently still content with the hypocrisy of adopting a position which recommends the use of medicinal nicotine products to treat addiction to smoking, but advocates prohibition of consumer nicotine products which do the same thing, but better. Cliff Douglas, 
former vice president of tobacco control for the American Cancer Society said, disturbingly, who continues to ramp up its efforts to destroy the one version of harm reduction whose potential far surpasses that of all others to reduce illness and save lives globally? Who continues to take a short-sighted, unscientific approach that appears to dismiss the legitimate concerns of millions of adult smokers across the globe who have been unable to quit smoking by any other means? The report recommends that member countries should treat e-cigarettes the same as smoking, with high taxation, bans, and restrictions to sales outlets and access on the consumer market. Indeed, the WHO report on the global tobacco epidemic 2021 glorifies countries with bans as poster children of effective tobacco control, like India, where they have denied millions of smokers a safer alternative. Now to Australia, where vapors may be forced to the black market, or worse, to combustible tobacco. As many know, on the 1st of October, it will be illegal for anyone to import nicotine for personal use without a prescription from a medical doctor. From the 1st of October, the penalty for importing nicotine e-liquid without a prescription will be up to 222000 Australian dollars. However, since this proposed regulation was passed, there is a new pro-vaping Deputy Prime Minister, Barnaby Joyce. I've listened to the people who have actually had to deal with being on the bungers. Uh, they're the ones who know how to get off them. And all the comments I get is, mate, this is... Look, we're not saying nicotine's good for you. No one's that dopey. We all know nicotine in any form is bad for you. But if I've got a choice between you know, lighting the grass and sticking it in my mouth or, or you know, vaping, I'm going to go with vaping every time because uh, that, that's the one that helps them break the habit. Will the new Deputy Prime Minister be able to sway the current government's anti-e-cig stance? Or will Australian vapors be forced to the black market or worse, back to combustible tobacco. We speak with Dr. Colin Mendelson about the impact of the regulation on vapors and smokers, as well as any influence the new Deputy Prime Minister may have on the regulations. How will the regulations affect vapors in Australia on October 1st? The main thing that's going to change from the 1st of October is the new penalty of $220,000 for bringing uh, nicotine into Australia without a prescription. So vapors will need to go to a doctor, um, get a prescription, send it to the overseas vendor and have it returned with their order. One of the problems is being able to actually get a prescription. Um, very few doctors are willing to prescribe nicotine. Uh, they've been constantly told by the health authorities and the AMA that this is not uh, a, a good treatment for smoking and they don't know much about it and they're very rather negative about it. So um, I'm sure some vapors will, will go back to smoking. This is all going to be too hard. Um, uh, and it'll certainly prevent some smokers uh, taking up vaping. Um, but many vapors are stocking up their freezers with nicotine uh, in advance and that in itself is a problem. But um, yeah, I think it's going to be a big problem for a lot of people. How do you think these regulations are going to affect the smoking rates in Australia? I think after the 1st of October, some vapors will go back to smoking because it'll just be all too hard to go through this process and, and, and to access a, a nicotine prescription. Uh, it's certainly going to be harder for smokers to make the switch to vaping. Um, it's already difficult in Australia, and uh, I think many will decide this is just not going to be possible for them. And I think the decline in smoking rates will go down. Um, we already have a fairly slow decline in smoking. So I, I think what's coming up in Australia will, will slow that even further. We haven't reached our national targets for some years, and I think this will make it even harder for us to, to achieve that goal. Do you feel that the new Deputy Prime Minister may be able to influence the current government's e-cigarette stance? 
Look, I don't think we can turn back the regulations at this stage. Um, they're pretty much locked in. What I am concerned about is that on the back of this regulation, there will be further restrictions. I mean, we're seeing that in Canada. They're now having approved vaping, they're now um, looking at ways to restrict flavours and reduce nicotine content. And I think that is a potential disaster. But uh, Barnaby Joyce, our Deputy Prime Minister, is a smoker. Um, his partner, Vicky Campion, uh, is uh, actually a vapor. And Barnaby's come out in public uh, and, and quite been quite open about supporting vaping. So he's certainly an ally. Uh, I think the most important thing vapors can do is to contact their members of parliament and tell them their story. And another thing the vapors need to do is to uh, make lots of noise in marginal electorates, because again, that influences the political process and decision making uh, even more, I think. And now for updates on the situations in Malaysia, Mexico and New Zealand. Dr. Stephen Chow, the president of the Addiction Medical Association of Malaysia, at their conference called for more intense public and professional engagement to examine the issue of tobacco harm reduction. With long-term research, tobacco harm reduction can be a pragmatic approach to reducing the harm of smoking-related diseases. Currently, there are over 4.9 million Malaysians who smoke and it is estimated that more than 27,000 Malaysians die each year from smoking. We had previously reported on the situation in Mexico, where organizations such as ProVapeo Mexico have been fighting for the right to vape. In July 2021, the Mexican Supreme Court exempted heated tobacco products from the February 2020 presidential decree that banned importation of electronic nicotine delivery systems. Unfortunately, vapes that use e-liquids continue to be banned by the Mexican government. New Zealand released the final of the Smoke-Free Environments Act regulations on the 10th of August. Whilst they are less restrictive than was feared, there are parts that require clarification, such as the requirement of a serial number to be on equipment, not the packaging, of non-disposable devices. We will have more information the next time. In collaboration with global advocacy organizations worldwide, we announced the launch of the Right to Vape Testimonial Database. I live in Northport, Alabama. I'm 41 years old. I smoked for 23 years. I quit smoking using vapor products. I vape now for eight years. I quit smoking using vapor products. I have been smoke free for almost three years now. I'm happy to say I'm an ex-smoker for 12 years. I use flavored vapor products. Caramel, bourbon, custard. I smoked cigarettes for 25 years. I quit using vaping and have been vaping for six years. This website provides consumers the avenue to leave their stories of how they switched and their thoughts on the current prohibitionist climate around safer nicotine products. As mentioned by Clive Bates, we are the evidence. I tried to quit numerous times doing everything from hypnosis to patches to nicorette gum. None of them did it would succeed. We need to get louder. We need to encourage and support one another and educate the public about who we are and why we're doing what we do. We are the evidence and we need policymakers to listen and understand that. Thank you for your help and support and let's keep this going. We are stronger together. When the Right to Switch petition campaign was launched, it was hoped that we would be able to reach 10,000 signatures minimum in time for the COP9. To date, the petition has reached that goal and continues to grow. Thanks to a call to action from CASA of its members in the United States, ANASVAP in Spain and Latin America, and EFRA in Europe, we are now hopeful that we will be able to gather at least 20,000 signatures, if not more. <music>